Hello, everybody. Uh, I wish you a happy new year and welcome to our Ringvorlesung Beethoven unter der Lupe. Uh, today's session will be in English. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Martin Norduin from Oxford University, who is our guest today and who is still in Oxford. Um, I present uh, Martin, who comes from the Netherlands. He is a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Oxford University and he is located at St. Cross College. And he's working in the uh, research project Transforming 19th Century Hip. That means historical informed performance practice. And he has um, completed his PhD on Beethoven's tempo indications at Manchester University in 2016. And that's the topic of his talk today, understanding Beethoven's tempo indications. We are very happy to welcome uh, Martin here and we'll have a discussion afterwards. Uh, you can also put questions in German He's perfect, perfectly able uh, to speak German, but uh, his lecture will be in English uh, for understandable reason. So thank you uh, so much, Martin, uh, to joining us. And uh, we are very uh, happy to have you here. And yes, thank you. Ja, herzlichen Dank für die Einladung, Arnold. Ja, bevor ich beginne, einige Dinge im Voraus. Ich weiß, dass die anderen Vorträge in dieser wunderbaren Reihe auf Deutsch waren, aber Meine wird jedoch auf Englisch sein. <lacht> Vorwiegend deshalb, weil Englisch die Sprache ist, auf der ich üblicherweise publiziere. Und natürlich auch deshalb, weil wir den Vortrag im Internet auch Zuschauer und Zuschauerinnen zugänglich machen wollen, die kein Deutsch sprechen. Und für keine andere Grund natürlich. Die deutsche Fassung meines Textes wird in naher Zukunft verfügbar sein. Also jetzt gehe ich weiter auf Englisch. Well, thank you for uh, tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. What follows now is both based on my PhD research as well as on some of the work that I have been doing since. You don't have to look very hard, especially coming off the back of the Beethoven year 2020, to find someone who has an, has an opinion on Beethoven's tempo indications. Here are just some in, from the last couple of weeks. So in the last year, not only did musicians and musicologists like me offer their opinions, but also data scientists, mathematicians, social media influencers, podcasters and philosophers. Now, I say this right at the start in order to point out that due to the number of contributions on this topic, I will not be able to address all of these individually in this talk, although I will address some of the underlying principles that they share but I'm getting ahead of myself here. At first, it is easy to see why there is such an interest. Beethoven is one of the towering figures of Western music, and there is an entire music industry that tacitly or otherwise gently pushes the idea that it is somehow good to follow what the composer had in mind. Here's a, one of my favorite examples from the conductor Benjamin Zander. This is the press release that accompanied his most recent uh, recording of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony with the Philharmonia, in which, uh, in which it says in, in, in loud font, London's Philharmonia Orchestra and the Philharmonia Chorus realize the composer's true intentions. So you can see that this is an idea that is really doing a lot of work. Now, furthermore, Beethoven himself was very interested in communicating his ideas around performance practice to the musicians who would play his music, as many scholars have documented now. Now, in addition, the metronome was invented during Beethoven's life. This was a device that could be used to indicate precisely the number of beats per minute. So it is easy to see why everyone is disinterested in this topic. Beethoven clearly had a particular way of playing in mind and had the ability to express this accurately. Great. So, what's all the debate about? Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. Many of the metro marks have been criticized for being ridiculously fast, amongst other things. Uh, the metro mark for the opening movement of the Hammerklavier Sonata, Opus 106, is probably the most cited example of this. And I have to say that I can sort of see why. 
even the great Arthur Schnabel, who recorded it some 90 years ago, and who had a pretty good technique, had difficulties tackling this. Let's briefly listen to uh, what he does with the opening, and you'll see what I mean. And here's the, um, the first Viennese edition of the piece, and here, here's how Schnabel tackles it. Particularly if you are used to the pristinely clean recordings that are produced nowadays, Schnabel's attempt to play this piece at the indicated speed sounds like a very capable pianist being hopelessly in over his head. So to many who listen to performances like this, including some very respected musicologists such as Sir Donald Tovey, um, they have concluded that there must be something wrong with this metronome mark. Either Beethoven must have somehow broken his metronome or he must not have used it correctly or perhaps most straightforwardly he was simply wrong about what is feasible or musically sensible well in short there is by some a strong urge to explain these inconvenient metronome marks away now before i go on i do have to mention that there are several much more successful recordings of this particular piece uh, at Beethoven's indicated tempo now. Um, uh, look, for instance, for Stefan Müller, and perhaps most impressively, I think the South Korean pianist Minkyu Kim, who uh, both of them managed just fine, and the recordings are available on YouTube. Look them up later. They're really, really good. Uh, Minkyu Kim's recording is, in fact, a live recording, but it's quite astonishing to watch. Another more general objection to Beethoven's metronome marks is that they constitute an overdetermination by the composer and that they limit the creativity on the part of the performer. Now, many performers that I speak to are perfectly aware of Beethoven's metronome marks but simply choose to pick their own tempos for their own artistic reasons. And to get back to the earlier example of the Hammerklavier, many great pianists. Uh, pay Beto uh, uh, Beethoven's metronome marks here, no mind at all, although one suspects that some will be able to approach them quite closely should they actually want to. I'm thinking here particularly of pianists like Grigory Sokolov and Yuya Wang, who, considering their enormous technical prowess, wouldn't have much trouble attaining the indicated speed, but simply choose to play it much slower for their own artistic reasons. Now, in this paper, I am not going to address explicitly all the validity of, of, of the various approaches taken to Beethoven's tempo indications, nor am I going to tell you how fast or slow you should play this music. What I will do instead is show how an understanding of Beethoven's tempo indications will help clarify the debate around these indications and allow the making of historically informed decisions that would otherwise not be made. Now, I'll do this first by outlining the principles of Beethoven's tempo as articulated in his earliest writings. And then I will show how these correspond to the metronome marks that he produced some years, some years later and present a model of a sense of tempo. And finally, I will discuss two short case studies that demonstrate how this, uh, this work can lead to artistic decisions that would not otherwise be made. So let's start with the principles of Beethoven's tempo. Beethoven's earliest written comments on tempo can be found in the sketches of the song Klager 
Werkel und Hofer's Style 113, which remained unpublished throughout his life, and of which, he, of which he drafted two different versions in 1790. Now, on a half-finished draft of the first version, the statement on the screen uh, is written. And I'll go through this uh, line by line in a minute. This is quite dense, and understanding this is key. So what follows will be sung even slower, adagio or andante quasi adagio at the most. Andante in a 2-4 meter has to be taken much faster than the tempo here in this song. It seems that it is impossible that the second section remains in 2-4 because it is much too slow. It appears best to set the section in alla breve. The first part in E has to remain in 2-4 because otherwise it will be sung too slowly. One would sooner take a slow tempo in the case of long notes than with short ones. For example, with crotchets slower than with quavers. The shorter notes also determine the tempo. For instance, semiquavers or demi-semiquavers in 2-4 make it very slow. Semiquavers, uh, uh, 16th notes. Um, Perhaps the converse is also true. Now, let's go through this line by line, because there's a lot there. The first and second sentences indicate that Beethoven intended the minor section to be slower than the tempo at the beginning of the song, and much slower than Andante in 2-4 would normally be. Andante was evidently the uh, tempo indication that he had in mind. Now, as the third, fourth, and fifth sentences indicate, his solution to this problem was to write both sections in different meters, which resulted in the major section at the start remaining in 2-4 and the following minor section being changed into a la breve. Both meters have two beats in every bar, but they are indicated by different note values in 2-4 by crotchets and in a la breve by minims. It seems likely that the sixth and seventh sentences refer to the principle that meters with larger note values indicating the beat suggest a slower tempo than those with smaller note values. The minimum beat in alla breve can therefore be expected to be slower than the crotchet beat in 2-4, and if the same number of notes per beat uh, is maintained, the music will sound slower in alla breve than it will in 2-4. It is for this reason that the minor section, which is the which in the first version contains two quavers per voice part for every crotchet in 2-4, is written with two crotchets for every minimum beat in alla breve in the second version. Now the last two sentences of the quote seem to allude not to the note values in the time signature, but to the range of note values that are used in the bar. An increase of smaller note values also implies a decrease in speed. The somewhat ambiguous last sentence perhaps is also best understood in this light. It implies that the chosen tempo also determines the range of note values that the composer can use. Now, the relevant parts of the song in the first and second version are on the screen now. Now, in the first four bars of the second version, very little has changed beyond some minor alterations in the piano part. But after the double bar at the end of bar 15, Beethoven changed the time signature from 2-4 to alla breve, doubled all the note values, and added a tempo indication clearly in, uh, communicating a slower tempo. And these three factors combined, note values, tempo indications, and meter, were used by Beethoven to communicate the tempo that he had in mind at this point. And this is further supported by musical treatises circulating at this time, particularly Kierenberger's Die Kunst des Reinen Satzes from 1776, some part of which Beethoven copied by hand and which describes tempo in almost identical terms. So let's have a quick look at what Kierenberger wrote about how to indicate tempo. Now here's the first part of the relevant section in Die Kunst des Reinen Satzes. The aspiring composer must have a correct feeling for the natural tempo of every meter, or for what is called tempo giusto. Regarding meter, 
those having larger values, like a la breve, 3, 2, and 6, 4 meter, have a heavier and slower tempo than those of smaller values, like 2, 4, 3, 4, and 6, 8. And these, in turn, are less lively than 3, 8, or 6, 16 meter. Thus, for example, a lourde in 3, 2 meter has a slower tempo than a minuet in 3, 4 meter. And the latter is, in turn, slower than a passe in 3, 8 meter. Now, in the first sentence, Kienberger states that there is a natural tempo associated with every meter, which students of composition should make themselves familiar with. The second sentence establishes that this natural tempo, or tempo giusto, has a slow and heavy pulse in meters with large note values, like 3, 2, alla breve, and 6, 4 which gets progressively quicker in meters with shorter node values, such as 3, 8, and 6, 16. It should be noted here that the word pulse refers to minims in alla breve, crotchets in common time, etc., etc., and that therefore minims in alla breve have a slow, uh, uh, are slower than crotchets in common time, as the third sentence also implies. Now, let's clarify this quickly with an example. On screen is the same melody, which is uh, uh, written twice, and this is the same. This is the melody found in Beethoven's choral fantasy, Opus 80, with two different time signatures and two different ranges of note values. In A, the melody is written in minims, and the time signature is alla breve, which constitutes a minim pulse and two notes per bar. In B, there are two crotches in every bar, and the time signature is 2-4, since a crotchet pulse is faster than a minute. Minimum pulse B has a faster tempo giusto than A. Okay, but Kienberger is unfortunately not done yet. It gets a bit more complicated now. Here is the second part. Regarding, uh, regarding note values, dance pieces involving semiquavers and demi-semiquavers have a slower tempo than those that tolerate only quavers and at most semiquavers as the fastest note values in the same meter. Thus, for example, a serabande in 3-4 meter has a slower tempo than a minuet, even though both are written in the same meter. Thus, the tempo giusto is determined by the meter and the longer and shorter note values of a composition. Once the young composer has a feeling for this, he will soon understand to what degree the adjectives largo, adagio, andante, allegro, and presto, and their modifications laghetto, andantino, allegretto, and prestissimo add or take away from the fast or slow motion of the natural tempo. In the fourth and fifth sentences, Kienberger argues that the shortest note value used also has an effect on the tempo. As an example of this, he compares the sarabandas and minuets in the fifth sentences, implying that the former generally have a shorter range of note values than the latter, which would result in a slower, uh, slower pulse. Um, keen students of Bach will, of course, be able to tell you that there are, uh, in, Bach, in Bach's first French suites, um, sorry, I'm going to say this again. Keen students of Bach will, of course, be able to tell you that in Bach's first French suites, there is an exception to this, uh, with the... Um, with the Sarabande having larger or the same range of note values as the minuet, but that's by the by. The sixth sentence offers a summary stating that both the long and the short values influence the tempo along with the time signature, and the seventh sentence indicates that the Italian tempo indications also affect the tempo, as we have seen. Now here too, uh, an example might clarify this matter somewhat, because it's getting more complicated now, and it will be important later. Now, the examples on the slide all contain the same material as before, but with a different range of note values. Much like A, discussed earlier, C, on the slide, is written in alla breve, but with note values half the size. Since C has shorter note values than A, the minimum pulse in C is slower than in A. Despite the slower minimum pulse, however, C will sound much faster in performance than A on account of the fact that C contains two notes per minimum pulse and A only one, which results in C occupying half as many bars as A. Despite D and B, no, but, but, sorry, between D and B, there is a similar relationship, but in the opposite direction. 
D will have a faster crotchet pulse than B on account of the absence of crotchets, but it will sound slower in performance due to the fact that the pulse is indicated by the crotchet beat. So despite the fact that it will have the slowest minimum pulse of all four examples, C will sound the fastest in performance, followed by B, A, and finally D, in which the relatively fast pulse is offset by the longer notes. Now, although the precise extent to which Beethoven followed this particular model cannot be accurately assessed before 1815, when he acquired a, a metronome, there is substantial evidence that this model had some practical significance. One example is found in the account of Gerhard Wegler, Beethoven's childhood friend, who claimed that the finale of the piano trio, opus one, number two, was written in the wrong meter and with a range of note values that did not reflect the speed that Beethoven had in mind, something that was pointed out to the composer by the cellist Kraft during an early run through of this piece. Now the sketches of this piano trio indeed show a passage written in what appears to be a la breve and with a range of note values exactly half of the corresponding passage in 2-4 in the final form. So although Wegler in, in general is a very reliable source, his memory probably fills him here in the details because Wegler uh, said that Beethoven had marked this initially as 4-4. Beethoven has never used 4-4 to the best of our knowledge and the passage was probably written in 2-2. Uh, now, another example of the same system still working is found in the well-known letter that Beethoven wrote in 1812 to the publisher of his Mass in C, Opus 86. You will, uh, you will have received the corrections for the Mass. At the beginning of the Gloria, I have written alla breve instead of common time and changed the tempo for, uh, from the original indications from Allegro Combrio to Allegro. I was seduced into doing this because of a bad performance during which the tempo was taken too fast. Now, not having seen the mass for a long time, this caught my attention immediately and I saw that ultimately such a thing must be left to chance. You can therefore see Beethoven's care in matters of tempo in the fact that some of the Italian tempo indications in that mass are just absurdly long the opening curia, for instance, is marked Andante con moto assai vivace quasi allegretto ma non troppo. So clearly, Beethoven is struggling to express the tempo that he has in mind, and it's possible that he may have used the tempo giusto system incorrectly at times. For now, all you need to remember is that the evidence indicates that Beethoven had to rely on the choice of meter, note values, and Italian tempo indications in order to indicate the tempo that he had in mind, a system that was, shall we say, ambiguous at best. You can imagine that by comparison, the metronome would offer a relatively straightforward means of communication. So, 25 years after writing the comments on the first version of the song Klage that we have discussed earlier, Beethoven acquired access to the recently invented metronome, which he started using pretty much immediately. The first metronome mark by Beethoven, and perhaps I think the first metronome mark written down ever, stems from December 1815, from the score of the cantata Opus 112 that Beethoven sent to Michael Umlauf, the conductor um, uh, uh, at the premiere of that work that was to be taken place at uh, on Christmas Eve of that year. And here you can see it. These two, there and there, might be the, 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 the world's first ever metronome marks. Unfortunately, the next year, 1816 was a particularly disastrous year for Beethoven. He spent much of it distracted by the ongoing court case with his sister-in-law, and he clearly suffered from depression, all of which led to compositional inertia and a declining productivity overall. So it is no surprise that we find no metronome marks from 1816. But in 1817 and 1818, however, 
Beethoven really got to work with giving metronome marks to the pieces that had been the most important to him during his career. The eight symphonies that he had finished up until that point, the 11 string quartets, and the septet. Here they are. And on the left, you find, uh, as far as I can tell, the only copy in existence of, uh, or one of the, uh, one of a handful only, of um, uh, the metronome marks for uh, Beethoven's string quartets. And this is a copy uh, in New York that I found. The next piano sonata that he wrote, the Hammerklavier, that we heard earlier, was also the first major work that included metronome marks in its first edition. Several minor works with metronome marks were also published around this time, including several songs and a fugue for string quartet. Finally, although slightly too late to miss the first edition, Beethoven also provided metronome marks for the Ninth Symphony, something which we will return to at the end of this talk. Now, all in all, there are 139 metronome marks by Beethoven, and it seems that he had planned to provide many more. In his correspondence with his publishers, he promised metronome marks for almost every work written in the last decade of his life. In most cases, however, the work in question was published before Beethoven could deliver. Now, how do these metronome marks match the principles outlined above? Well, seemingly irrespective of other factors that you would expect, such as the instrumentation and the genre, seemingly irrespective of that, the same range of note values, meter and tempo indication, almost always correlates with a similar speed, as Rudolf Kolisch first observed in 1943. Now, to name just one example out of many, the fourth movement of the Fifth Symphony and the first movement of the String Quartet Opus 74, both allegros in common time, with oh, that's um, here we are, both allegros in common time, um, uh, with crotchets, quavers, and semiquavers in scale figures, are both marked minimum equals 84, despite the clear differences in instrumentation and in character. Now, furthermore. Allegros in common time with more extensive semiquaver figurations have slower metronome speeds, such as the Allegro Risoluto and the finale of the Piano Sonata Op. 106, which is marked um, just a speed of minimum equals 72. Well, it's written out as crotchets e equals 144, but that's what it boils down to. In the case of slow music, that is andante and slower, the same pattern is observed, but in that case, only note values that appear within the first dozen bars or so seem to count. Again, to pick one example out of many, um, the Adagio Manon Troppo second movement of the String Quartet Op. 74 and the, and the very short Poco Adagio in 3-8 in the last movement of the String Quartet Op. 18 number 6 both have semiquavers as small as note values at the start and have similar metronome marks that is quaver equals 72 and 69 respectively. It's not a you know, substantial difference. Despite the fact that the former contains extensive demi-semi-quaver and even heavy demi-semi-quaver figurations after about 60 bars, as you can see on the slide here. Evidently, that doesn't matter. Now, the lack of influence of factors such as the venue in which the music is expected to be performed, or the number of instrumentalists per part on the metronome marks, might suggest that they were merely intended as theoretical goals. However, the well-documented interest that Beethoven expressed in all matters related to tempo, uh, as along with the fact that, with very few exceptions, all of his metronome marks were set after the work had been performed or rehearsed several times, suggest that his method of marks must also have had some degree of practical significance. So on first sight, it appears that Beethoven's metronome marks follow his earlier stated principles. But as we will see in a moment, this isn't entirely true, and there are ways in which he departed from what he wrote before. But in order to fully assess how Beethoven's sense of tempo worked at this point in time, it is necessary to take account of a broader picture, rather than focus on individual data points, as I've done until now. 
considering that the same range of node values, meter and tempo indication almost always correlates with a similar speed, it should be possible to model Beethoven's hypothetical speech for each speeds for each combination of those factors. And with this, we can both provide hypothetical metronome marks for each section and see to what extent Beethoven followed his earlier articulated principles later in his life once he got hold of a metronome. Now, one of the problems with creating this model is that the 139 metronome marks that Beethoven wrote are clearly not enough data for every combination of meter, range of note values, and tempo that Beethoven used. Now, luckily, there are editorial metronome marks by some of his close associates, the pianist Carl Czerny and the pianist Carl, uh, Ignaz Moscheles and the violinist uh, Carl Holtz. We might be able to draw on those. Czerny was involved in the earliest attempt at the Gesamtausgabe, so a complete edition, um, of Beethoven's works, being recruited by the publisher uh, Tobias Hasslinger to edit this edition after Beethoven himself had died. The earliest issues by Czerny uh, came out in 1828, just a year after Beethoven's death. So considering that Czerny had lessons for many years with Beethoven, the earliest metronome marks for the works for which he studied with the, uh, which he studied with the composer surely have some value here. Now, Moscheles and Holtz had uh, somewhat more distant relationships to Beethoven than Czerny. Holtz played second violin in the first performances of the late string quartets and wrote a short text concerning the performance choices that, supposedly with Beethoven's blessing, were made at the time, including the speed and metronome marks. The problem is the text wasn't made publicly available until the 1850s, so some three decades after the event, and it is not entirely certain when Holtz wrote it. Moscheles um, produced several editions of Beethoven's piano works, more or less in parallel, parallel with Czerny, um, but he probably had the least direct contact with Beethoven of the three people here, having lived in Vienna only between 1808 and 1816 and only returned once in the 1820s. But he still heard Beethoven play on several occasions. So while it may not be true that the metronome marks by Czerny, Moscheles and Holtz always represent Beethoven's intended tempo accurately, they clearly have some value here, particularly if they are for works that we know the author studied with the composer. So now we have a whole lot of metronome marks for a vast part of Beethoven's oeuvre. The thing to do now is to sort them according to meter and tempo indication. And the collection of pieces in uh, common time, marked Allegro, for instance, looks something like the following table. Now, it's quite a large collection of works. Don't worry, I don't expect you to read all of them at, at once. You can find this table in my thesis. And let me just uh, quickly explain what you're looking at. Metronome marks surrounded by straight brackets indicate the range of editorial speeds and the ones without brackets are by Beethoven. Now, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but I will just say how I made sense of this data. I sorted these both by tempo indication and by the range of note values and removed any editorial metronome marks that very clearly broke the pattern and that were not justified by a, by a, a uh, explicit connection to a lesson by Beethoven or something like that. Now, if you do that, you get the following and much more straightforward table, this one. Here, the straight back brackets um, indicate my own estimate of the speed based on the symmetry of the table, and the asterisk in the bottom right-hand corner indicates a combination which does not occur in Beethoven's oeuvre, at least to the best of my knowledge, although we could probably hazard a guess at what the tempo might have been. So, we now have a table with predicted speeds that on the whole seem consistent with some of Beethoven's earlier statements. It looks indeed that faster note values clearly imply slower speeds. But wait, we're not done yet. If we do the same thing with Allegro's in 2-4 and Alla Breve, the following two tables are created. Now, what can be concluded from the comparison of these two tables? Well, for one, it seems that 
one a la Brera bar in Allegro Manon Troppo with quavers and semiquavers takes about as long as a 2 4 bar with demi semiquavers and semiquavers and with the same tempo indication. In both cases, about 44 bars would fit in a minute. And the same is true in other parts of the table, although admittedly the comparison is not always as precise. Now, furthermore, similar observations can be made between 2 4 and alla breve bars in other tempo indications. Here, for instance, are the estimated speeds for adagios in 2 4 and alla breve. As you see, one of them is uh, almost precisely uh, double the other. So they run pretty much parallel. So what can be concluded from the fact that in Beethoven's metronome marks, the same number of notes per 2-4 or a la breve bar result in what is, in practice, the same speed? Well, keeping in mind the aforementioned changes that Beethoven made to the finale of his piano trio, Opus 1, number 2, as well as those on the autograph score of his song, Klage, it is pretty clear that there has been a change of principle in Beethoven's sense of tempo. Changing the meter from 2-4 to alla breve and doubling all the note values, or vice versa, as Beethoven did in the above mentioned examples, results in no practical change, in performance at least. So somewhere between the early to mid-1790s and 1815, there must have been some development in Beethoven's sense of tempo. But this consistency also proves a number of other things. Now, firstly, and perhaps most obviously, Beethoven's sense of tempo was clearly still guided by strong underlying principles. And secondly, the fact that these tables draw on metronome marks by Beethoven as well as three other musicians make it virtually impossible that a mechanical defect or an incorrect use of the metronome is the reason that some of these speeds are the way they are. It is just punishingly unlikely that they are all, that all three, all four uh, musicians misused or broke their metronomes in exactly the same way. Now, thirdly, using the observed consistency, we can make prediction uh, predictions. <clears throat> thirdly, using the observed consistency we can make predictions of the metronome marks for pieces for which Beethoven did not leave any, which could lead to new and interesting historically evidenced interpretations. And fourthly, we can even hypothesize what the tempo of certain pieces would have been if they had been written with a different range of note values or in a different meter. So this opens the door to uh, the substantial rethinking of very well-established aspects of performance practice. Now, I will show you uh, uh, two ways in which this can be done in the last part of my paper. I'll just give two short case studies. Now, because I've been speaking for quite a while, I think, I will just present these two. Um, they're both quite short, luckily. Now, the first case study involves the opening section from the third movement of one of my favorite piano sonatas, the Piano Sonata, Opus 110. Um, this is a very short section, only three bars long, before it is interrupted by a recitative, as you can see on the slide. And actually, the edition that you're looking at is actually one of Czerny's editions, and this is his metronome mark. Let's um, remind ourselves what this music sounds like. This is a uh, performance by Andras Schief. Moscheles' metronome marks for this short section range from quaver equals 66, as you can see there, to 69. So it's fairly slow and they're very consistent, 
with each other at least. And a vast number of pianists, including obviously Andra Schiff heard just now, play it in the same range or even slower. Now I would say that playing this passage very much faster than Schiff does now um, is pretty difficult to justify in the current performance climate. I have seen people try it during masterclasses only to be shot down. But despite its popularity, in the context of other metronome marks for Adagios, this speed is a real outlier. Of all the editorial speeds given to Adagios in common time, it is by far the slowest, despite it having both uh, this, this Adagio both having relatively large node values and a relatively fast tempo indication. It's Adagio Manantropa, it's not Molto Adagio. It is the opposite of that. Now here are all the other ones. You can see this particular one is the slowest of them all. So there's something wrong here, perhaps. At least something that we need to explain. I should say that there is no evidence that either Czerny or Moscheles ever discussed uh, this work with Beethoven, or even had the opportunity to do so. By the time that this sonata was completed, that is the year 1821, Moscheles was no longer in Vienna, and Czerny had never claimed to have played, uh, has never claimed to have played this piece in front of Beethoven. In fact, by the time that this piece gets published, uh, Czerny is so busy with teaching that there would have been hardly any time to. Furthermore, as I have recently shown in uh, an article in the journal 19th Century Music Review, there is evidence that before Moscheles published his edition of the Sonata um, in London with Kramer, he was visited by Czerny, and it seems highly likely that they compared notes on what they were doing. So it is plausible that the, um, the fact that Czerny and Moscheles agree is nothing more than that. It doesn't represent necessarily what Beethoven had in mind, although they have certainly been very influential and very persuasive. But looking at the table, one ha you have to uh, uh, estimate this, but perhaps a speed as far uh, as fast as crotchet equals 60, close to um, the fastest adagios in this meter, as the tempo indication and range of note values indicate it should be, is perhaps something that Beethoven had in mind. Now, if you try this out in practice, I can't do it here now, I don't have a piano here, um, but you will see that this section turns from a very heavy and pensive passage, uh, although it was beautifully played by André Schiff, into something much more resembling a short three-bar introduction from an Italian opera, which actually, considering the material that follows, really seems appropriate to me. So in summary, it seems likely that this particular passage has been played well, far slower than Beethoven had in mind by a pianist as far back as about, well, two centuries ago. Now, my final example concerns the famous Schreckensfanfaren that opens the last movement of the Ninth Symphony. Is this one. Uh, let's have a quick listen. Now, as you can read in, amongst others, the wonderful Neil Hendler edition about which Beate Kraus spoke to you some, week, some weeks ago in this series, the uh, metronome mark for this section was first written down by Beethoven's nephew Karl in a conversation book in September 1826. Cutting a long story short, um, you can read all about it in my upcoming article on the subject in early music, wink wink. Uh, the early sources, all of which are in Karl's hand, list the metronome mark as dotted minimum equals 66. And you can see this here. While the later sources, these include a letter to Moscheles in London and uh, the published metronome marks as they appear in uh, the score, all list dotted minimum equals 96, as you can see over there. Now, almost a century ago now, um, Otto Bench had argued that the cause of this was a misprint by the publisher, 
which was copied into all the other sources, and that the original dotted minimum equals 66 in Karl's hand corresponds to the speed that Beethoven had in mind, an interpretation that is echoed in almost every discussion on the topic since, including the aforementioned Hendler edition. Now, however, despite this scholarly consensus, Bainch's interpretation is a bit less plausible if one considers the principles of Beethoven's tempo indication that I've explained several times now, um, because there are a number of very notable inconsistencies that can be observed here. Now, first, compared to all of Beethoven's metronome marks for presto in 3-4, dotted minimum equals 66 is really suspiciously slow. The third movement of the string quartet over 74 in quavers throughout is marked dotted minimum equals 100. And the subsequent presto quasi prestissimo um, in crotches throughout has a speed of dotted minimum, uh, of, sorry, of dotted semi brief equals 100, which is three times as fast as dotted uh, minimum equals 66, which note values only twice as large. The presto of the seventh symphony, uh, mainly in crotches, so we expect the speed to be a little bit faster, is with dotted minimum equals 32 exactly twice as fast as the speed in the conversation book. And the subsequent assai meno presto contains fewer quavers than the Schreckens von Fahre, yes, but with uh, dotted minimum equals 84, it's still significantly faster, despite its clearly slower tempo indication. So dotted minimum equals 66 for a presto in three forward quavers is unmistakably something of an aberration compared to other prestos in Beethoven's oeuvre. Now, second, other sections with a speed of dotted minimum equals 66 in the three forward quavers as the most common note value, um, such as the third movement of the string quartet, opus, 90, uh, opus uh, 59, number two, that has, uh, has a speed of dotted minimum equals 69, they generally are marked allegretto rather than presto, so that's also suspicious. The third, even Beethoven's metronome marks for sections marked allegro with quavers are a lot faster than dotted minimum equals 66. Now I would invite you to look up the following as they are not on the screen. Uh, the Pio Allegro that follows the uh, Allegro Assai uh, Allegro assai vivace ma serioso in the third movement of the string quartet opus 59 is marked dotted minimum equals 80. The third movements of the string quartet opus 18 number three and the second symphony are both marked dotted minimum equals 100. And the third movements of the sixth symphony and the string quartet opus 18 number one are both marked minimum equals 108. Now, although these allegros do not all have the consistent, although these allegros do not all have the constant quaver figuration in the same way that the Schreckens von Fahler has, the figuration clearly has an effect on the overall tempo, as allegros without, qu without quavers at all are faster still, such as the scherzos from the third symphony, that is allegro vivace, and at a, at a speed of dotted minimum equals 116, and the septet opus 20 which is marked Allegro Molto e Vivace and has a speed of dotted minimum equals 126. Now, all of this makes dotted minimum equals 66 for a presto with quavers rather suspect. And the dotted minimum equals 96 that ended up in the puppet sources much more likely to be what Beethoven had in mind. But this raises the question how dotted minimum equals 66 ended up in the conversation books in the first place. A possible explanation could perhaps be found in the setup when the marks were produced. It is unlikely that Karl had the score of the symphony in front of him, as otherwise he would have written down the speed there straight away and not in the conversation books. So it seems most probable that Beethoven, possibly seated at the piano, had the autograph score and Karl had the metronome and the conversation book. As Peter Staten has shown uh, about 50 years ago, the only other score uh, that Beethoven had of the Ninth Symphony at this point, which is the presentation copy for the, bring, the King of Prussia, was 
uh, at the binders at this particular time, so they couldn't have used that. In such a setup, it would have been particularly difficult to provide a metronome mark for this presto in dotted minims. The syncopated rhythms and the offbeat leaps in the melody distort the easy sense of a 3-4 bar filled with quavers. And you can see this in, the, in this example on the screen. This is the, the top line that you would need to follow uh, if someone is playing this on the piano. In fact, Carl could have very easily heard a 3-4 bar filled with triplet quavers, which would have resulted in a metronome mark for a presto that is a third slower than what Beethoven actually played. I would invite you all to try it yourself and see how hard it is to get a metronome to line up with the bar lines. I find it very, very difficult. It therefore could be hypothesized that the initial dotted minimum equals 66 was based on error by Carl, copied by Carl in all the later sources, and that Beethoven sent the publisher the number 96 as a correction later. Now, although such correspondence has never been found, it would also be very easy for a short note with a single correction to disappear. And we do indeed know that several letters by Beethoven to publishers have been lost. The alternative explanation that Beethoven was uniquely inconsistent in this presto, only for the publisher to misprint it at a more consistent speed, relies on an extraordinary coincidence and therefore falls foul of Occam's razor. Now, thus, on balance of probability, dotted minimum equals 96 seems much more likely than dotted minimum equals 66. Now, given the scrutiny to which other metronome marks, other metronome marks in the Ninth Symphony have been subjected, the fact that Bench's, uh, Bench's explanation has gone unchallenged is absolutely remarkable. Principally, this may reflect the prevalent view of performers and scholars that dotted minimum equals 96 is simply unfeasibly fast. The earliest recordings of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which had just started to become available when Bench was doing his work, generally stay far below dotted minimum equals 96. And more recently, David Levy, um, sorry, more recently, David Levy has claimed that, and I quote, there can be no doubt that 96 is a mistake, as the music is absolutely unplayable at this speed. And the conductor, Benjamin Zander, whose um, Schrecken von Fahrer we heard a few moments ago, has described the speed as obviously preposterous and truly ridiculous. On the other hand, no 19th century commentators considered dotted minimum equals 96 to be too fast for the Schrecken von Fahrer. George Grove, for instance, despite condemning semi-brief equals 116 in the presto of the second movement as almost impossible for the horns, uh, stated that, and I quote, Beethoven's care that all the indications of tempo, etc., should be fully given in his published works was as minute and as unfailing as usual, and left the dotted minimum uh, equals 96 for the Schrecken von Weyler, otherwise unremarked upon. Felix Weingartner, around the turn of the 20th century, went so far as to explicitly sanction the speed, writing that, and I quote, the metronome mark dotted minimum equals 96 is too fast for the bass recitative, although not for the fanfares, for which he furthermore recommended the quickest speed which is compatible with a continuous fortissimo, end of quote. So although that speed may seem overly fast and more aspirational than an actual goal to be achieved, there are historical reasons for at least attempting it. And there is no historical reason to limit the speed to dotted minimum equals 66, as many have done. However, a conductor may prefer the slower speed for his or her own artistic reasons, or, as Weingartner also implied, because it is the maximum attainable with the forces at hand. My personal view is that a slightly scrambled, perhaps slightly chaotic rendition of this passage is perhaps far more effective as a terror fanfare than the rather neat, controlled, 
Stubenrein version that you hear in most performances these days. Now I'm going to leave it at two examples today, but I'm sure you understand that there are many more like it, and I would invite you to have a look at my thesis to find them. So in summary, an understanding of Beethoven's tempo indications can open up new options for interpretation. It may even take away some long-held objections against certain interpretations, and it will clarify our understanding of Beethoven's creative process. But what it does not do, however, is absolve us of the responsibility of making our own creative choices. No one is obliged to follow Beethoven's metronome marks unless they say that they are doing that. And there is no guarantee of success if you do. All that they are good for, as far as I am concerned, at least for intelligent musicians, is to show artistic options that you might want to consider. Now, finally, should you have any questions or comments about my paper, either in English or in German, you're welcome to get in touch with me. Um, I would like to ask you, however, to contact me directly rather than leave comments under this video once it has been placed on YouTube, which I'm unlikely to see. I do not venture in YouTube comment sections. My contact details are now on the screen. You can email me, or if you like, you can even tweet at me. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you warmly for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.